Hi, and welcome back to day two of Next 18. You just heard our main keynote, bringing the cloud to you. Thanks for joining us. I'm Rhoda Meyer. And I'm Stephanie Wong. We have a full day of programming ahead for you, including showcases from AI, industry solutions, data analytics, security, and more. Make sure to join the conversation across all social media platforms using the hashtag GoogleNext18. But before we dive in to discuss all of the exciting announcements shared this morning, here's what's happening on the next live show. On this channel, we'll have a spotlight session on transform work, driving culture change, productivity, and efficiency. A fireside chat with two pioneers of computer architecture, John Hennessy, chairman of Alphabet, and David Patterson, distinguished Google engineer. Our Google Cloud customer innovation series continues with tech and business leaders, a spotlight session on rethinking big data analytics with Google Cloud, as well as Cloud AI, how to get started injecting AI into your applications. And over on the featured Spotlight Sessions channel, we have spotlight sessions on adding intelligence and agility, applying artificial intelligence, security trust for Google Cloud, cloud native development with SAP, Google Cloud's IoT vision. Now let's get to the recap of this morning's main keynote. Joining us now is Greg Wilson, developer of Cloud Developer Relations. Welcome, Greg. Hey there. It's uh, nice to meet you in person. Yeah, you too. <laughs> so uh, let's today. Start. Yes. <laughs> so uh, let's start with the big picture. What would okay. you say was today's main message? Um, a lot of it's just doubling down on some of the scale that we we've, we've had. It, 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 one thing that struck me today is after four years at Google and hearing terms for the first time like petabytes and all, it, I'm still blown away by the scale. Like there was a comment made about Google Maps having a billion active, you know. So Crazy Users number. Every, I, mean, I can't even get my head around that. Yeah. Uh, talking about BigQuery, um, uh, mentioned that we have customers you know, querying 23 trillion rows of data. And I'm old enough to remember when I queried a million rows, I <laughs> thought that was kind of crazy. If you do the math, that's a tiny, tiny fraction. Yeah. Um, so like a lot of us doubling down on that, like bringing ML to BigQuery, I thought was kind of a, a huge context shift for a lot of people. It was for me. I think it was for a lot of the folks in the audience. I mean, a lot of people that aren't familiar with BigQuery, they see, you know, they, they hear about it, they know it's a database that can query 23 trillion rows. Um, but when you start thinking about applying ML to the data that's already in there, that just kind of blows your mind a little bit on what could be accomplished. So that really struck me. Um, one of the other things that really caught my attention was with IoT. Hmm. Uh, many years, I've had friends, I've dabbled a little myself, and I've had friends that were in IoT, and it's always like little pet projects. And, um, and you know they'll have some fun little device doing something. But now when you start looking at like the industrial use of IoT and how it's actually affecting our lives uh, and the possibilities it's bringing, it just feels like it's reaching that point in the technology evolution where it's really about to, to, to go crazy and we're going to see things we can't even imagine today. And so like announcements today, I think set us up for that. Like um, being able to have like edge TPUs, you know, taking that type of incredible hardware power and, and putting it into a small device out on the edge and then the software that backs that and the cloud services that backs that, it just makes me think about IoT like very differently than I've ever thought of it before. It just so that's that's super exciting. I mean a lot of us developers have used Google Maps APIs for years. I think it's one of the first Google things I ever touched, you know, yeah. way before I ever worked for Google and it's a lot of fun. You write a little code and a map appears with a dot on it. But gosh it's come such come such a long way since then. I mean, people using it in business to make decisions and to track packages, tracking sharks, as she mentioned. <laughs> uh, you know, all those uses that what's going on in gaming with Maps is mm. mind blowing to me. You know, I never thought of Maps API as um, evolving into that type of platform. So I thought that was incredibly cool. That was a surprise to me. Yeah, it's, it's amazing how there's this huge scale, enterprise scale stuff, but we can yeah. still, as developers, we can still play with a lot of it. Oh yeah, you know, it's all toys does. Exactly, right. yeah. exactly. <laughs> so it's, it's wonderful to see uh, people being enabled, both uh, tinkerers yeah. at home and, and enterprises building real businesses exactly. on the same material. Well, to see all the stuff that we, we played with and tried to justify playing with it, now it's becoming a, a real mainstream thing, Absolutely. and now there's this huge demand building up around that stuff. Yeah. It's kind of vindicating in a way. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Sounds like we're on the cusp of a wave of possibilities with the kind of technology, totally. as you said. And you mentioned BigQuery, you mentioned IoT. Are there any other products or features that stood out to you? A lot of the talk around security. I, I love it that, that you know we're really starting to uh, double down on our, our strength around security. Right. Um, 
one of the things that, that really struck me when I hired on to Google is it, Google Cloud is not just Google saying, hey, we should offer this service. Oh, and we should make it secure, by the way, because mm -hmm. customers want that. That's not what it is. Like Google is 20 years history building these incredible products that have millions, billions, tens of billions of users. And you think about all the security challenges that we face, some of which we've heard about, some of which I'm sure we haven't, but just all of that experience dealing with security and being baked into our products in the beginning. It's not like we just decided, you know, three weeks before we ship, oh, we need to add some security features. You know, a lot of these things have been serving Google for years, way before we made it a public cloud service. So just seeing that really, you know, strengthening. And customers starting to see it. I mean, we're getting traction in that. People are starting to get it. You know, things like Gmail that we take for granted. Um, you think about some of the statements that were made in yesterday's keynote and today's keynote around the security and the track record we have there, it's right. impressive. So. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I mean, one of the things you mentioned, and we heard a lot about this in the yeah. keynote, was scale. You know, yeah. you talked about petabytes of, of, yeah. of data, you know, billions of rows, you know, all of this sort Trillions. of stuff. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's crazy. Every, every year we Take add an extra zero, else. right? So I've forgotten how to count that lot. Right. Yeah. So t tell me, you know, when you hear all of that about this scale and about these products, you know, what strikes you as, uh, as how this sort of is, uh, how this sense of scale affects us at Google? Oh, uh, well, the one thing about scale, you know, you used to, you know, I'm, I'm old enough when I, had my first computer that had over uh, a meg of memory and the whole, I'll never need more than this. <laughs> uh, my first serious hard drive that my father loaned me money to buy was a 200 meg hard drive. To express that in terabytes <laughs> requires a lot of zeros <laughs> after the decimal point. So as, as much scale as we're talking about, a lot of people may think, I don't need that scale. Mm. But when you think about what IoT, IoT is bringing and all this new data that's being collected, uh, the amount of data that we're going to create as humans over the next few years is staggering. I mean, if you look at some of the estimations, it's just mind blowing. So this scale is important. It's going to be important to people that think it's not important today. And, and you know, I'm not to sound like a marketing guy, but you know, you want to make decisions now that get you in a platform that has proven scalability. Like we know how to do this. You know. It, it, Google's had to deal with it just from rolling out their own products. Some of the challenges we faced behind the scenes way before we decided to get into the public cloud business, just you know, building a uh, map system that could handle the billion users a day, uh, handling Gmail, which who knows how many millions of emails have gone through since we've started this conversation. <laughs> the tech that goes into that scale um, is, is super impressive, and I think it puts us ahead of, of you know, everyone else, I'm quite honestly. Yeah, it's all very impressive. I mean, you talked about how we're really baking our internal strategies into our products. Yeah. How else do you think um, threading this approach into our cloud strategy is going to really shape the future of our cloud? Well, I think uh, you know we're we're getting to the point now where we're not just learning from our own things with scale and security, but we're starting to learn from customers. You know, we, it used to be. Here's the technology that all of our stuff runs on, and we, we learn day to day as we grow, but now we have like some major customers bringing different types of use cases that we've never imagined to our platform. And so I, you know, what I'm excited about over the next few years is seeing where all that leads. Like what's, you know, what IoT demos are gonna be showed next year. You know, I mean, we saw an incredible one today with like Chevron and some others, but like, what are we gonna see three years from now as the demo, you know, and I think it really positions us well. Uh, the security requirements that we're going to need in the world to get smarter, you know, on both sides. And uh, um, with every new technology, there's always, you know, new attempts to exploit that. And I think Google has a good track history of, of doing that. So I, I think it's our ability to adapt and, and learn from our customers. And I think that's, you know, that's what's exciting about it. So I think the thing which kind of I was most excited about, and I think I'm probably not alone in this, in yeah. the keynote, was, uh, was all the cool stuff around IoT. Yeah. So can you give us a, a summary of like what's, what's cool, what's new uh, happening around the IoT world? Yeah. Well, it's, it's the scale of IoT, really. You know, IoT is more than um, you know, Raspberry Pi or you know, some little uh, gimmicky thing that you do that we've all built and had a lot of fun doing. <laughs> Uh, it's, it's thinking about putting you know, sensors in uh, industrial complexes where you have thousands of sensors creating a you know, ton of data. Uh, that all sounds easy until you get down to really, how do I implement that? Well, you have to be provisioning every one of those sensors and tracking them and knowing how to handle the data, where to store the data, how to analyze the data. 
Uh, and so you look at like cloud IoT core, the things that we announced today around uh, moving some of that technology out on the edge, mm -hmm. where it's handled, you know, like, uh, basically TensorFlow Lite running on the edge using some specialized hardware out on the edge, and then be able to take care of a lot of the ML aspects of it, and then all the cloud services that go behind that, the provisioning and all the configuration technology that goes behind it. So that's what I was saying earlier. It's, it's, um, it makes you think of IoT in a whole different light. It's, it's not a toy anymore. Yeah. It's still a toy, but it's not it's, a toy. It's anymore. also a toy. Yeah, it's but also, it doesn't like have everything to else be. we it's touch. It's totally exclusive. Right. Yeah. <laughs> everything we do is a toy to us. Uh, it's, um, I mean, it's fun stuff, but to see it being used in these, some of these real-world applications, like, and like life-changing, like you know, seriously human-affecting. Um, uh, implementations, that's that's super exciting. And, and today we're just seeing the hints of it. You know, some cool announcements today. I think it sets us up for some amazing future. So. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks, Greg. We really appreciate you, you taking the time, giving Anytime. us your insights. Yeah. I appreciate it. Thank you. Of course. Thank you. Uh, now, uh, let's head over to the showcase to see more Google Cloud products in action. and we're here with Steve in the AI Solutions Lab. Steve, what's AI in Motion? So AI in Motion is a demo that shows how artificial intelligence can perceive the world, uh, make predictions about it, and then take action on those predictions. Awesome. Um, and so what we've actually got here is a demo showing these robot balls. They're made by a company called Spheros. Mm -hmm. um, and some of them are controlled by humans here playing the game. Yes. And some are controlled by AI. So uh, what we've got is an AI model that actually perceives the whole playing field okay. and uses object detection to identify where the balls are and where your obstacles are. Right. And then another model that uses reinforcement learning to basically set the strategy for the robots. Oh, that's really interesting. Yeah, it's been super fun. Tell me a little bit more about how people might go about learning more about what we're doing with machine learning. Yeah, I mean, honestly, I'd go to cloud.google.com slash machine learning. Um, you can look up TPUs. Yes. All these models were trained on TPUs. Mm -hmm. um, you can look up CloudML Engine, which was also a technology that was used. And then go to tensorflow.org to see how you can use TF Lite, TensorFlow yes. Lite, to deploy these models and shrink them down so they can run on a, a phone. Awesome. which is what these ones are doing. Yes. How can people learn a little bit more about AI in motion or what Google is doing in general in machine learning and artificial intelligence? Cool. Well, let's go check out the TPU booth. All right, let's do it. So TPU is a tensor processing unit. It's a chip for processing large amounts of data for machine learning and other kinds of tasks. Awesome. Tell us a little bit more information about it. Yeah, so this is a TPU V3. Okay. And this is our third generation, which we announced today. It's available in alpha. Great. And it has 420 teraflops of processing power. Right. Quite impressive. Um, this one back here is our second generation of TPU. Okay. This one is actually generally available, and it's even available for free tier customers in Google Cloud awesome. with 180 teraflops of processing power. Amazing. Can, yeah. you, can you give us an example of a customer that might be using Sure. So eBay has used the TPU V2 to improve their image uh, recognition oh. by 100x. Steve, can you show me one more thing in this AI lab? Sure. Let's go take a look at AutoML. All right. Let's do it. Awesome. So here we are at the AI Building Blocks oh, yes. booth. Uh, and let's talk about AutoML. Yeah. So tell me about AutoML. So AutoML enables you to retrain models with your own custom data mm -hmm. without having to get into the guts of, of writing your own training loops. Awesome. You can do it using a UI. Mm -hmm. And okay. here in the web is a UI. We're training a model to understand the difference between different types of clouds I see. appropriate for this conference. Yes, absolutely. Um, so you can upload your, uh, your basically your images uh, in batch. Inside of the web UI here, you can see statistics for how your model's performing. Mm -hmm. um, you can even resume training if you're not satisfied with the, the accuracy you're getting. Okay. Resume training and, and capture all of the value you've gotten so far and get even yeah. better accuracy. So you don't lose all your hard work. That's right, exactly. Yeah. Um, and then see the evaluations of your results. Um, and including down here, if I can scroll to it, a confusion matrix, which shows you false positives and false yes. negatives. And, and then ultimately host your model for prediction on the cloud. Awesome. I guess one of the really uh, interesting things about AutoML is just how easy it is to actually get started with with machine learning. It's typically quite a high barrier to entry to say, how can I get started with machine learning? Yeah, we've always loved the usability of the ML APIs. Yes. We've had them for 18 months or so. Mm -hmm. But AutoML enables those same APIs to be just as easy to use, but now customizable to exactly what your business needs. Yeah, awesome. Well, thanks so much, Steve. Really Absolutely. appreciate your help. Thank this you. has been one of my favorite um, installations. So thank you. Thanks, thanks for Natalie. joining us.
I'm Yuri. I'm here with Luke Mon, and we are at the AI Solutions booth here at Google Cloud Next 2018. And today we're going to talk about the recommendation engine. So Luke Mon, what is a recommendation engine? So a recommendation engine is one of our AI solutions. It's uh, what we call a reference architecture. Basically has code and a set of papers that describes to you how to implement this kind of solution on Google Cloud Platform. What can I build with it? Well, let me show you. So um, this shows you an example of an e-commerce store where the user might be scrolling through a whole catalog of items, picking ones that they're interested in, say they're adding them to a shopping cart. Um, as soon as they do that, then um, the, uh, the data that, they've, that we've collected from them in that store can be sent to this recommendation engine and essentially recommend other items or products that they might be interested in buying. It works off of Google Analytics data, a very popular product that Google has had. Uh, our Google Analytics 360 product allows that data to be directly synced to Google Cloud into BigQuery, basically what our data warehouse solution. Um, from, from BigQuery, the data is exported into cloud storage and then used as an uh, input to a train a model in TensorFlow that provides the recommendations. Uh, that model is loaded into App Engine, which serves as the API, essentially. And this is where the application server for the, the client application would make a request to the API saying, I've got a user, give me five recommendations for that user. Um, important to know that you've got to not recommend things that users have already bought or purchased. So you got to filter those ones out. Anyway, you provide that back to, to the user, and then, um, on the store, you know, the user would see these items that we've recommended to them in addition to the ones that they've already bought or purchased. Excellent. So very, very popular application. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Now, let's take a look at another example of using AI, this time at the contact center. Right. So, Steve, why don't you, uh, how can we apply AI to, to the contact center? Yeah, well, thanks. And uh, when we were looking at the market, we we're trying to find you know, more natural ways to apply AI to the marketplace. And the contact center seemed like one of the more easy ways, one of the more natural ways to apply it. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to help out when people call in to get much more easier assistance when they talk to a virtual agent versus having to go through a complicated phone tree. And we're also trying to help out the live agent when you eventually get connected to them, make their job a little easier, provide them help as much as we can. And AI was a very easy way to do that. So what I want to walk through, I want to walk through a demo of a, a a person actually calling in to contact center AI and try to show you how much different that is than the normal experience we have. So what you're going to see is a person calling in and, and they're going to get responded to by the, by the virtual agent. At least the virtual agent is going to try to answer all their questions. So what happened is, is uh, one person's calling in. I just placed an order recently and one of the items are damaged. And so as the person's calling in, the contact center AI is able to discern what they're talking about, interpret it into real text, and get the context of the conversation. So the virtual agent knows it wants to return, but it needs a little bit more information. One, two, three, four, five. So it needs to go look up what the order number is to figure out what they actually want, re want returned. They also need to authenticate the customer, making sure it's the right person calling in. One, two, three, four. And so with this information, the virtual agent is actually going to be able to process the claim, process the refund, send an email to the customer, and actually process their, all their concerns on the spot. And it connects automatically to an enterprise's knowledge base on the back end and their fulfillment processes. And that's how we're using AI to help out contact centers. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. If customers want to learn more, where should they go? So they should go to our website. Uh, and check out our, our, our Cloud Contact Center AI solution. They can sign up for public alpha access right now and hopefully get access to one of our partners that we're working with. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. We'll have a lot more of our showcase coming up on later in the show. The first spotlight sessions of the day will begin shortly. Stick around afterwards for more Next Live. We'll see you then. Welcome back to the next live show. We're here with one of my uh, friends and colleagues, Eric Schmidt. Uh, Eric is a uh, technical program manager for Google Cloud. Thanks for joining us, Eric. Thanks, Rachel. So uh, we're here at the NCAA Experience. Eric, what is this? Uh, physically, it's a basketball court inside of the Moscone Center. Yes. Uh, because why not, right? <laughs> Google Cloud became the official cloud provider for the NCAA. Uh -huh, so nice. out on the court right now, we're recording attendees live at 180 frames a second, wow. performing analysis on their shooting mechanics, 
So as an attendee walks off the court, they get an email that goes to an IPython notebook. They can open it up and look at all their shooting mechanics. I, I can't think of a better way to make uh, sports ball more entertaining for nerds than to give them analytics data for there everything they've been doing. It's, That's right. it's kind of amazing. So uh, I'm looking at, at a giant leaderboard scoreboard over here. I assume this ties into some of the data and analytics. Uh, yeah. What is it we're looking at here? So what we did to make this fun and gamey is we built a game for the shooting session. An attendee has 60 seconds to put as many shots up as possible. Uh -huh. For every shot, um, and we're tracking this in real time, we give them a, uh, a score that they could potentially get if they make the shot. And the score is a function of distance, how far they move from their last shot, as well as the probability. This is kind of like their, their score juice, if you will. Right. So, if you're making lots of shots, your probability is going to go up. If you're missing shots, etc., and this is based on a training set from a couple thousand shots. This all runs locally. Uh, we use uh, TensorFlow serving to do all this analysis locally here on the court. Right. But then we're pushing all the data up into the cloud through Cloud Spanner as well as BigQuery so that we can retrain. Mm -hmm. We're also using Firebase to drive this scoreboard in real time. So uh, tell me, uh, what's the relationship then that we have with the NCAA? The NCAA. It's kind of like a typical enterprise. They have lots of data, lots of customers. All those schools are collecting data. And it's just not about basketball. You're talking about softball, soccer, et cetera. So they have lots of data all over the place. We're helping them build to build data analytic workflows on Google Cloud, uh, leveraging things like BigQuery. That's awesome. This is live, this is live television. <laughs> Um, helping them build these analytic workflows so they can make decisions like potentially moving the three-point line back or changing how the ranking system works for, for competitions um, or looking at you know impact of travel schedules on, on student-athletes. Yeah, that's fantastic. Yeah. Right, well, I mean, I'm always looking for tips on my shot. Do you, do you mind if I maybe give this a go and see if I can learn some tips? You bet. All right. Let's, let's try it out. Let's do it. Right. Hold your left hand out for me. Crown you king of basketball. Fantastic. Come on, Rado. Yeah. Come on, Rado. Yeah. Yeah. You took a lot of hard shots, so I got to <laughs> hand that to you. Your last shot was a launch angle, 44 degrees, which is good. So. You know, for the for that location, release height, you're getting some good release. Rotation, 100 RPMs, that's good. So overall, really good shooting session. I bet you if you come back and shoot again, you'll be at least, say, 40, 42%. Oh, of course, yeah, <laughs> double it at least. Thanks, Thanks for your time, man. right? Cheers. All right, uh, that's it for us here at the NCAA Experience. If you're at Next 18, head on over to Moscone South so that you can improve your score. I'm sure you're going to do a better job than me. We're going to head off to the showcase team now and see where they're at. Thanks for joining us. Hi, my name's Natalie and we're here in the security zone where we're going to be speaking about smart access from anywhere. So I'm here joined today with Grant, who's, hi, go, hi there, who's going to walk us through this zone. So firstly, uh, we know security is so important in the enterprise, right. particularly um, as it relates to connecting to devices. Uh -huh. So tell us a little bit about how Google's innovating in this space. Yeah, so um, most enterprises really care about how they're employees get access to their corporate data. Yes. And the traditional solution is to use a VPN where you sort of tether back to your network uh, inside of the corporate network and get access that way. But VPNs are, are pretty painful. They don't work great with mobile devices. They're sort of frustrating to set up and they don't lead to a very good security perimeter, especially when applications move to the cloud like SaaS applications or other applications that are running in the cloud. So at Google, we've developed a replacement for VPNs, which we call Beyond Corp, or Smart Access from Anywhere. And the idea is that instead of connecting through the VPN, you can connect directly to the applications on the internet, but we can use policy based on your network and your device in order to enforce strong security when accessing internal applications without the use of a VPN. Why don't you kick off by showing us how this actually works? Okay, great. Uh, so we have a story here. It starts with Sally. So Sally is a sales rep at Zotkix, and she needs to access data inside a CRM application. So you can see that there's two computers here. There's an unmanaged device, which is a tablet, and there's her managed corporate device. And inside the corporate network, Sally has access both on the unmanaged device as well as on the managed device. 
However, when Sally transitions to the coffee shop, she goes and stops at the coffee shop on her way to visit a customer. The corporate policy is that she should lose access on the unmanaged device because there's no screen lock, maybe there's someone looking over the shoulder or something like that. So if she tries to access this application from the unmanaged device, you'll see that access is denied. However, on the managed device, she still has access to the application uh, because policy allows for access to exist on the managed device. When she travels internationally to a hotel in a foreign country inside a restricted region, then the policy changes yet again. Inside this country, her access is denied to the sensitive application from the managed device. Now note that all these policies are configurable, so the security team at Zotkix has decided who should have access where. But you know, Sally decides she wants to extend her stay in the restricted country by a day, and uh, she needs to shoot her boss an email. She's not able to do that on the unmanaged device. If she tries to access her email, she'll, she'll get access denied even on the unmanaged device, as you can see. But she is able to access her mail on the managed device because it's only a medium trust application and the policy allows that. That makes sense. I think that's one of the biggest distinctions for customers is to understand the difference between managed and unmanaged right. devices. Right. So we can obviously see here the devices that are managed have the uh -huh. Chrome management exactly. um, console exactly. and able exactly. to kind of push down those policies right. in seconds. So. You have more you have more context and information about those devices exactly. and so you're more comfortable allowing data access from more places. Exactly. So smart access from anywhere allows Zotkix to define a custom security policy and enforce it across different environments with across and across their fleet of applications without using a VPN. Thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate it. It was really nice having you. Well you're welcome. Thank you Natalie. Not a problem. Hi, I'm Yuri. I'm here with Daniel here at the AI Platform booth at Google Cloud Next 2018. And then today, we're going to talk about Kubeflow. Yeah, so Kubeflow is an open source machine learning framework. They focus on the infrastructure side of things. So this is to run training and serving jobs on the Kubernetes cluster. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So the textbook ML problem is handwriting recognition. Yeah, that, that's a classic problem we're always trying to solve. All right, so can you show me how Kubeflow can be used to solve it? Yeah, so right here, uh, we have a, a standard website that's running a handwritten recognition problem on it. So right now, our model isn't trained, so it's just giving us random results. So we're going to use Kubeflow to train a model that will improve on that. If we have a standard TensorFlow file here, there's nothing Kubeflow specific for this. So now we just need to turn this into a container and push this up, up onto Google Cloud. So you're actually taking a machine learning model and you're making a container image out of it. Yeah, we're containerizing it so you can write once, deploy anywhere. Amazing. And now that's finished being built, it'll be here on Google Cloud for us to see. So the next step is to push the training job onto the cluster. So we have the script here called train that will do that for us. So because Kufo is using Kubernetes, we actually get to make use of all the resources that we have on Google Cloud. But we can still manage this using our laptop or any other device we have handy. So now Kufo running on our website will have found our new version and it'll update our model accordingly. So now the website that we showed earlier should detect our new model, and we can see it's a lot more accurate than it was before. Excellent. That was very cool. If folks want to learn more, what should they do? Uh, yeah, so there's a Kubeflow website that they can check out, and this is an open source project, so anybody can get involved in GitHub. All right. Thank you very much, Daniel. Really appreciate it. Yeah, nice meeting you. Thank you to our hardworking showcase team for sharing all these interesting product demos with us. Okay, coming up on the next live show, we have a very special discussion with Turing Award winners John Hennessy, the chairman of Alphabet, and David Patterson, distinguished engineer at Google. You don't want to miss that. And on the other channel, we have Applying Artificial Intelligence with featured speakers from Accenture. Stay tuned. Welcome back to the next live show. I'm here with Dave Renson, Google SRE Director. Thanks for joining us, Dave. Thanks for having me, Riddle. Now, uh, you've written a few books on the cloud now. Um, mm -hmm. Your latest is an O'Reilly publication, the Site Reliability Workbook. Yep. Beautiful tone. Uh, it's a collaborative effort this time, right? It is. Uh, who is it meant for? Uh, anyone doing production engineering in the modern age. Okay. Um, we all want our little things to grow to be very large. And what happens when they do? And how do we make that happen to work? 
This book is the work of 150 plus Googlers plus 25 or 30 people from outside of Google. Big, you know, New York Times and Netflix and, and all sorts of wonderful companies. That's Home Depot. fantastic. Yeah, it was really neat. Now, uh, as you said, it wasn't just Googlers. You no. know, you mentioned a few companies. Um, what made you bring all of these people, all these new authors from other places on board? Well, you know, the big thing is two years ago when we published the first SRE book, there weren't a lot of SREs outside of Google. There were some, but not a ton. Uh, it, it spread very far and wide now, and there are a lot of other companies who have a lot of really useful stuff to teach the world about how to SRE, if you will. And we thought, like, no implementation book is going to be complete if we don't include those voices. And, and we're really glad we, we did that. Some of this content is, is really pretty special. That's fantastic. Now, you know, you mentioned sort of Google and these other big companies. Now, I would think that being an SRE at a th you know, place like Google where you've got thousands of, of SRE specialists is going to be pretty different from a company of like, you know, 30 people total. Well, you know, this is a, a common kind of a question. I think the important thing is to separate the principles of SRE from the, from the practice of SRE. The principles of SRE, error budgets and SLOs and SLIs, they apply at any scale. Two people, three people, 30 people, 3,000 people. That's not a problem. The practices are gonna change and evolve as you grow larger as you would expect to have happen. They have here, you know, we started SRE 15-ish years ago here at Google. We weren't 2,500 SREs, we were like three. <laughs> Absolutely. Now it's a uh, it's a it's a pretty it's a pretty hefty tome you've got here, uh, which is impressive. Say. A lot of people involved. Um, if if, an, if a CTO asks you, what's the one chapter I should read? How can I get the most out of this? What's what's the chapter you'd suggest, and, and why? Well, everyone on the editorial team has their favorite. My personal favorite is a chapter called Nowsdy, Non-Abstract Large Systems Design. It really walks through how as SREs we want you and expect you to think about how to construct a large distributed system. It's, it's, it's an incredibly useful skill that anyone can learn um, and a kind of technique that not a lot of people sort of intuitively apply. And we expect every SRE to be able to do it. And so that was very hard, but a lot of fun and very uh, uh, fulfilling to write. Oh, fantastic. It sounds like a really good way to sort of find out something new no matter what your experience yeah, is. Yeah, that, that chapter is going to be a new experience for a lot of folks. <laughs> fantastic. Now, um, this is book two. You've got, you know, you're on the way to a tri trilogy, if not more. What, what do you have in store for us? What can we look forward oh, to in, wow. in, in the third no, edition? No. We just launched <laughs> this one, and it was a lot of work with a lot of people. I, will there be a third book? I imagine there probably will. Actually, I hope there'll be a lot of them, and I hope they'll come from a lot of different places. What will it be? Man, I don't know. Ask me in six <laughs> months when the memory of this effort has worn off just a little. All right. Uh, we'll, we'll hold you to that. We're going to check you. back in. Now, uh, last question I want to know is, uh, how do you think that the move to cloud has really shaped this book? Well, I, I mean, the fact of the matter is, is before Google did cloud, we ran our infrastructure for ourselves. And so, in a way, we could kind of have shortcuts because we could prescribe to our developers, do it this way, do it that way, do some other way. When you're giving your infrastructure to other people, you've got a lot less control over how they use it, right? Yeah, absolutely. And also, the reliability they experience becomes a partnership. It's a combination of the decisions they make and the decisions we make running the infrastructure. And that was really the impetus for both books, is we can't expect them to have a good experience you know, if we haven't tried to help them think through how they're going to do it. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So uh, obviously the question everyone wants to know is, how can they get a copy of this book? Well, OK, if you're here at the show, um, there are 20,000 uh, uh, attendees. We have 5,000 books here at the show. Come by the, the fifth nine here uh, in Moscone West on the second floor. We'll give you a book, and, uh, and we'll sign it for you. All the editors and most of the authors are here, too. So if you're the first sort of 25%, if you're not in those first 5,000 people or you're not here at the show, for the next 30 days, you can go to google.com forward slash SRE, and you can actually download this book for free for the next 30 days. And of course, you can read the original there as well. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, free is uh, it's a hard price to Everyone's argue favorite price. <laughs> Absolutely. All right, thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. Excellent. Now, if you are here in person and you want to grab your own copy of this wonderful book, uh, come over to the Fifth Nine, Fifth Nine Lounge as it says behind us, located here on level two of Moscone West. The Fifth Nine Lounge is a dedicated space where Google SRE customers, DevOps, uh, people ops and teams can mingle, meet and exchange ideas and listen to SRE focused fireside chats and panel discussions. Now, our next live reporters are standing by with more showcase demos to share with us. So uh, what do you guys have going on over there?
Hi, I'm Yuri, and we're here at the Application Development and DevOps Zone. I'm here with Aja from Cloud Advocacy. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. Yeah. So why don't you tell us that what is it that we're showing here this week? So I've got two demos that I'm working on here showing Stackdriver, which is our resiliency and monitoring and APM framework for Google Cloud. One of our demos is showing how it shows you to various areas. We've got a big giant panel with a whole bunch of different buttons and stuff you can hit, and each one of those causes a different kind of error. And then you can see it reflected in the dashboards in real time. We've got another demo that's showing the dashboard status of all of the different interactive demos we have on the showcase floor this year. And so you can see what it looks like when you have a bunch of different demos using Stackdriver. And it kind of gives you an idea of what it might look like if you had a bunch of microservices or something else using Stackdriver. So in the error-causing demo, we've got a giant big button that takes down the load balancer. We've got another big button that simulates like a, an EPO emergency power off switch in a data center. And those buttons will take down various aspects of the compute infrastructure, load balancer, individual compute nodes. And then we also have a patch panel where you can cause various errors. And we've got some load generation buttons so that you can just hammer on them and generate load. If you like breaking stuff, if you have that little chaos generator type thing in you, this is the perfect demo for you. Awesome. So I'm going to be hitting buttons. We're going to be flipping switches. Stuff is going to break. What is Stacker ever going to show us? So we have, we're showing a couple different parts of Stackdriver. I've got the error reporting screen. So when we cause an error, you'll see the error show up, and you'll see that it last happened just now. But you'll also see in the logs, you'll see all the messages going to this GKE application that we're breaking. In the monitoring, you'll see that our latency goes up on our uptime checks, or maybe uptime check fails, and that the uptime on the various nodes fails. Awesome. All right, thank you so much. Hi, I'm Mark. We're at the Mobility and Devices Zone. I'm with Max from the Chrome Enterprise team. So Max, tell us, what is Chrome Enterprise? So very simply put, Chrome Enterprise is an OS, it's a browser, and it's devices all built for the enterprise. When we talk about Chrome Enterprise, it captures our consumer brands of Chromebooks, Chrome OS, and Chrome Browser, all used in that enterprise context. So what is the Cloud Worker? The Cloud Worker is a, um, it's a thought leadership campaign that we have, and it's supposed to talk about the new ways of working. Um, you know, if you think about a new type of employee, they're accessing from more devices than ever before. They're using more uh, SaaS-based applications than ever before. Uh, and this is creating new paradigms. Employees want to be able to access their data from wherever they are, and they want to be able to access it from all their devices. So what's an example of someone that might be a cloud worker? Um, so we have, we think that any type of worker can be a cloud worker. Sure. Um, at this booth today, we're actually showcasing uh, sales reps, uh, sales uh, frontline cloud workers. Uh, we also have marketing cloud workers. We have software engineering cloud workers. We're also showcasing IT administrators and how they can manage the cloud workers in their organization. Okay, let's take a look at one. Sure. So here um, we have, for instance, a sales rep. So a sales rep, um, if you think about it, what they're doing on a daily basis, they could be calling their customers. They can be reviewing pitch decks, um, they could be updating their CRMs. Uh, so in this booth, we wanted to show how somebody who is a sales rep could be doing that here. So in this demo, we actually have Cisco WebEx. If you press play um, on the demo, you'll actually see the balls in the display go up the tube, keeping it a little fun. <laughs> um, and um, in the demo, what we're actually showing is that a Chromebook, not only can you be a participant in a call, but you can be a presenter as well. So we're, we're excited to showcase that here. We're also showcasing here software engineering cloud workers, uh, marketing cloud workers, and IT administrators as cloud workers and as the folks who would be making sure that their employees are, are secure. Perfect. So we're really seeing how different types of people in the industry can really take advantage of the cloud and yes. transform what they normally do into a much more cloud-centric way. Absolutely. Fantastic. So where can people go if they want to learn more? Sure. If they'd like to learn more, best place to go is cloud.google.com slash chrome-enterprise. Um, we just revamped the website uh, in the past few weeks, so hopefully there's a lot of new information there for you to learn about Chrome Enterprise. Perfect. Thanks so much, Max. Hi, my name is Natalie, a cloud customer engineer from Sydney, and we are here in the security zone. And I'm joined today by Maya, who's Hi. going to take us through, firstly, the Google infrastructure tour. But I guess the first question is, we hear the term secure by design over and over again. We just heard Diane say it in the keynote. So can you kind of run us through what that means at, at Google? Sure, yeah, security is not, you know, baked in as an afterthought. A lot of things that we design at Google have security in from the get-go. So things how, like how our network is designed and secured, um, you know, we have multiple layers of security in place in multiple different spots so that if any single layer of security fails, you know, your data is still protected. 
Um, so let's jump in. Awesome, yeah, show us, how it's, show us how it's done. So I have this really cute picture of a dog here. Yes. And I want to save that to, to my drive because I want to look at it later, obviously. So I'm just going to drag that to my drive. This is a perfectly normal thing that you probably do every day. Let me save something to Google Drive. And while it uploaded like that, you know, there's lots of stuff that went on behind the scenes that we yes. didn't get to see. So we're uploading our file and it's connecting to Google. And you see it, your file, you know, flowing along these network cables to connecting to Google. And that channel is actually encrypted. So Google uses encryption in transit by default to our front end uh, using HTTPS. And HTTPS connections are provided by the Google front end or the GFE servers. GFE servers terminate traffic for, uh, terminate incoming traffic to Google, provide DDoS attack countermeasures, and um, are available in points of presence globally so that you can connect to Google closest to wherever you are. Um, so once it does connect to Google, you'll see you're, you're connecting to the actual you know, data centers that you might have. But what if your data has to go somewhere else? What if it has to go to another Google data center to, to, to have another um, operation performed on it? In that case, it travels across Google-owned fiber, including some of our undersea cables, such as this one that we have here, yeah. our undersea fiber cables. Cool. And these provide um, you know, thousands of miles of connectivity for our, for our data centers globally. Um, tiny little piece of fiber you yeah. see there, you know, multiple layers of steel, um, and then also covered in rubber before it goes on the ocean floor. We have to deal with things like shark attacks trying to get yes. to your data. So, I've heard. Uh, so protect against those as well. Um, next, and, and you'll see here we have a variety of network cables that we've already laid in blue and a variety of new cables coming in green. So we're constantly investing in our network. Uh, we carry 25% of the internet's traffic on our network backbone. Yeah, it's quite an impressive statistic, isn't it? Yeah. So once your data is at Google, how is that protected and how is it encrypted at rest? Well, your file, my, my cute picture of a dog, is going split to be split up into smaller subfile chunks for storage. And each of those chunks gets its own data encryption key for, for that specific chunk of data. What that means is that no two chunks of data, even if they're part of the same file, even if they're sitting on the same machine, and even if they belong to the same customer, they're encrypted with different data encryption keys. So, so your data has a super low level granularity of protection. Um, those chunks are then spread across Google's infrastructure. This is about reliability and, and accessibility, but also just, you know, that provides some additional layer of security that if somebody wanted to then access your data, uh, an attacker, she would have to go find all the chunks of data that, that belong to that file and also find the keys that belong to that file. So somebody, if somebody were to, for some reason, be able to get our data centers and walk out with a rack, they really don't have access to your data. It's encrypted and they can't, they can't get back to your data in plain text. And um, we rotate those keys. So when you write, uh, when you modify a file uh, or, or change anything in a file, we encrypt it with a new data encryption key rather than reusing the same key. And that just provides an additional layer of protection for how we protect that data. All right, so that's how your data is stored. But now we're going to process your data. Yes. So maybe we're going to you know, run a big query query on your data or open it up in Google Drive or something like that. And so we're doing something on these servers that we have in our data centers. Now these servers, how do we know that these are actually real Google servers, that they have the integrity that they need to actually run that job and, and whatnot? Well, each of those servers has a Titan chip on those servers. So it's this tiny little piece of, of, of hardware running in our, in our data centers and all of our, all of our hardware. And that provides, makes sure that only authorized machines can connect to the network. So we know that it's Google Drive, we know that it's BigQuery accessing your data, and we know that it's authorized to do so when it touches your data. And this is really key innovation for Google technology specifically, isn't it? It's, it's super cool <laughs> what these chips can do. And, um, and then, you know, once, once we're running compute and when all, all those, those are sitting inside our physical data center. So Google, we build our own hardware, we build our own software that runs in our data centers. We protect our data centers because they're so critical. We protect them with metal detectors, badge readers, um, with biometric scanners. And on top of that, we have interior and exterior high resolution cameras to protect our data centers, physical gates, um, some you know, local wildlife that's sometimes a little bit threatening, like alligators in some of our data centers, and, and uh, vehicle barrier access gates um, to make sure that only people who are supposed to be in our data centers are actually there. Uh, what that means is that actually a lot of Googlers never go to a data center. Um, so I've never been to one. I'm probably not going go to get to go to one. No, nor have I. Yeah, I'd like to, though. <laughs> less than 1% of Googlers will end up seeing a data center yeah. need a legitimate business reason to do so. Mm -hmm. So the closest you're going to get is our uh, you know, virtual reality 360 tour of our data center. Yes. So you can check that out on YouTube. Uh, using cardboard or one of these, and you can actually see what a data center looks like, and it's it's pretty cool. And you'll see you'll see the security guard standing in the corner the whole time, protecting uh, protecting the camera crew filming filming in our data yeah. centers. 
Um, awesome. So I think that was a really good demonstration to kind of reiterate the term, you know, secure by design. And I think it's something that's obviously um, very, very critical to Google and to our customers, but also something um, in terms of the way that we secure that makes Google Cloud in particular uh, very unique. Yes. Uh, owning everything from the data centers to the, All the physical, chips, physical chips, the how we, pipes. How the we encrypt data, you know, at multiple layers, how we make sure your data is yes. encrypted at our front end. We really, really care about security. Absolutely. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Thank now, you. hopefully that's inspired our viewers to want to know a little bit more about how we do security at Google. So where can they go to find out more? Uh, you can check out cloud.google.com slash security. And there's a ton of white papers, information, videos you can watch yes. uh, to, to learn more. Perfect. Well, thank you so much, Matt, thank for joining you. us. Really appreciate it. Thanks, everybody. We look forward to seeing more showcase demos later in the show. Coming up on the next live show channel, the customer keynote continues with a group of business and tech leaders discussing the cloud and its impact on their businesses. And over on the featured Spotlight Sessions channel, we have security and trust for Google Cloud. We'll see you back here after those talks. Stay tuned. Welcome back to the next live show. I'm Stephanie Wong. One of my favorite moments as a customer engineer is seeing all of the innovative ways our customers are using the cloud to transform how they work. In this next story, we'll see how Twitter's big data needs led them to Google Cloud. Take a look. You have to be a big enough cloud to be able to handle something at Twitter scale. We have things that run that nobody else can do, and we build technologies that serve those needs. We do an immense amount of data every second, and it's a live 24-7 service. We're in the business of helping people find out what's happening. And for my team, a lot of what that means is, is providing the tools and platforms that people need to get answers to questions about what are people tweeting about, what's going on in the world. Twitter overall uh, uses data centers for a lot of its infrastructure. And we've known for a long time that we should be using the cloud for at least some of what we do. We need more storage than most people. We need more compute. We're expecting to transfer around 300 to 400 petabytes to the cloud. It's hard to even describe how big that is. We actually had a very rigorous uh, evaluation process to determine whether or not this would even be possible. We did in-depth uh, analysis with many engineers over many months. When we came to Google, it was significantly obvious that this was a high-performance, high-quality cloud. Once you actually aggregate up the network differences, you know, the savings from having more flexible resources, then the difference was, was dramatic. Google Cloud was very impressive to us. It led in performance, allowed us flexibility in storage and compute scaling in both dimensions independently, as well as the big data suite of products that Google provided. Google's network is highly engineered and, and, and very high speed. The network was actually good enough that we could separate compute and storage. We're really thinking about this as a broader, longer-term relationship for Twitter. This is Twitter moving into a hybrid cloud strategy. If you look back at where Google was five years ago with their cloud to now, certainly the trajectory has been incredible. And if that continued for the next five years, we'd be very happy to benefit from it. I think this is very much going to be an open and evolving long-term relationship between Google and Twitter. Our showcase demos are a fantastic way to learn about our products and see how they work. Let's check in with our team for more. Hi, I'm Natalie and I'm a cloud customer engineer from Sydney and today we're in the data and analytics zone where we're going to be showcasing what Google Cloud is doing in the predictive monitoring space. So I'm joined here today by Sole. Welcome, Sole. Hi. Thank you, Natalie. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about predictive monitoring and how um, we're building that solution at Google. Excellent. So we've built an application called Flood Predict, yes. uh, which is demonstrating predictive monitoring. It enables organizations to be able to always have a critical view of a data feed, uh, okay. even when that data feed goes down. We're using machine learning to be able to actually predict uh, what that value might be. Yes. So in Flood Predict in particular, we're taking in stream gauge data, so everything from uh, water level height to the discharge, temperature, river condition, health, things like that. Um, and we want to be able to always have a view of that data. And so in this particular application, we're going to be showing 
for instance, the flow rate of the river over time. And I'm going to cut over to a different view of this, which has this pre-populated. Uh, so this is the actual flow rate uh, in a particular location in Montana uh, from about two months period of time. Now, when I toggle in the predicted value, we're using machine learning on Google Cloud technology uh, to be able to predictively show what that value for that stream gauge might be. Uh, and that's especially helpful in, in like spring runoff when it's flood season, if that gauge goes down, uh, which can be quite common, uh, you need to be able to understand what's happening with the river. Absolutely. So these are IoT devices that are placed along the, along the stream? In essence, yes. Yes, yeah. and it creates this dashboard for businesses to be able to make timely decisions. Yeah, exactly. I mean, critical view into a river. If, yeah. if it's flood season, you need to be able to understand what's happening. Awesome. Uh, and this also has lots of applications in, uh, in agriculture as well, yes. in, you know, say, pollution monitoring for gov government, public sector, uh, manufacturing, and others. Uh, it's worth also mentioning we've, we've brought Flood Predict to life yes, a little bit over show here. show us what you have here. And I so like in this particular case, we've, uh, we've physically built a, a representation of about two and a half months worth of time that's replaying uh, in the course of about five minutes. Uh, and in this case, we can, we can simulate what happens when one of the gauges go down, uh, which it happens typically in the spring with like large woody debris that floats down the river, it might uh, impact one of the gauges uh, sensors and that might uh, have it fail, et cetera. So when that happens, you can simulate that here. And you can see in site one, we've gone from reading the actual gauge data to the predicted data uh, for that particular moment in time. Okay, that makes sense. And this is quite interesting here. So this actually runs us through the flow of how the data is traveling. Correct, yeah. So these would be all your, your um, your locations and all the IoT data out in the field, and those would be pumped through IoT Core yes. uh, into PubSub and Dataflow, and then into your storage right. uh, with BigQuery here. Makes sense. IoT Core is really interesting, and, and yeah. I guess that's all around how we do the secure connections to devices exactly. that might be in the field. Yeah, correct. And then PubSub um, does the collection of the data, Dataflow, the Oops. ELT pipeline. Correct. And yep. then finally, BigQuery, of course, is our data warehouse, yeah. and then the predictive um, ML modeling on top. So re really great example of how the data kind of flows from being in the river into Google Cloud data solutions. Exactly. Awesome. Yeah. Well, uh, this is quite an interesting demo. And where can people go if they'd like to know more about what we're doing in the predictive monitoring space? Absolutely. So I would orient people to cloud.google.com slash solutions. Uh, we have a big data solution page there, which has lots of different examples. Um, we have things with predictive maintenance. Um, we're building out some stuff with predictive monitoring um, and, uh, and other, other IoT solutions there as well. Yeah, well, thank you so much for your time. Thank this you, has been me. really interesting. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Yeah, cheers. Thanks. Some really cool interactive experiences at the Showcase Zones. All right, it's almost time for your next sessions to begin. Coming up on this channel, a talk on rethinking big data analytics with Google Cloud and over on the featured Spotlight Sessions channel, Cloud Native Development with SAP. Enjoy the sessions. Welcome back to the next live show. I'm Stephanie Wong here at the Equality Lounge. The Equality Lounge is a women-focused, all-gender-inclusive drop-in space celebrating our diverse community of builders and innovators. During Next 18, the lounge offers attendees confidence coaching, professional headshots, panel discussions, and hashtag I am remarkable workshops. This is also where you can view a special piece of artwork created by illustrator Sam Rodriguez titled Changemakers. This mural honors four extraordinary women Morgan Debon, Patricia Graves, Miroslava Silva, and Rana Abdelhamid. All women who lead with inclusivity, empower change, and impact their global communities. Now, let's send it over to our showcase team for more demos. 
Hi, I'm Mark. I'm here at the Industry Solution Zone with Lath. Lath, what is your title? So I'm the uh, Media and Entertainment and Gaming Marketing Lead for Google Cloud. Perfect. And we're at the Media, Entertainment, and Gaming booth here. Uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about what Google Cloud does for Media, Entertainment, and Gaming? Sure. The theme of Next is Made Here Together. So we wanted that content to kind of shine through uh, in its own merits. Perfect. So uh, I see a couple of different game booths here. Why don't we talk about each one? Sure. Sure. Um, so one right in front of us is Jurassic World Alive. Uh, Jurassic World Alive utilizes GCP, but um, also, very interestingly, it utilizes the Google Gaming Maps platform um, so that you can uh, find dinosaurs in real life uh, on your phone and recapture uh, them and nurture them into their own uh, zones. Sounds uh, exciting. So it's a mobile game. We're very excited to have the Maps team uh, kind of with us on this one. Uh, we also have Dauntless and Worlds Adrift. Um, two of our kind of PC games. Uh, they utilize GCP very heavily. Um, a lot of their games kind of run on GCP. We want to ensure a very smooth player experience uh, for all of our games and for our game clients. And GCP is one way to do that. Of course. So using the cloud, they can kind of take advantage of, of servers and other configurations that didn't really exist before. And of course, we have kind of a, a big partnership with Unity yes. that also takes advantage of this. Yes. So Unity uh, is not just games. Uh, Unity is really a creative platform uh, for anybody who wants to create things in 3D in real time. Uh, our partnership, for the first part, does focus uh, on the connected game space. Mm -hmm. uh, so we want to simplify development for game devs and make it easy for them to access uh, Google scale. Uh, directly through the Unity editor. Uh, but Unity is really a creative platform for anybody who wants to uh, make awesome content. Perfect. And so we also have a big uh, team of animators behind us. Yes. Can you tell us a little bit more about what they're doing? Yes, we do. Uh, so the theme of Next is Made Here Together. And uh, we wanted to take that to its ultimate extreme. Sure. So we are actually making a 30-second animated short uh, throughout the three days of Next. We call it Robot Dance Party. Uh, you can see some of the characters behind me. Um, but what you'll see in the back is a real-time live animation studio uh, where animators are working on the short with the magic of the cloud and some of our partner solutions. They can be anywhere animating anything, anytime, because that kind of flexibility of the Google Cloud Network plus some of our partner solutions uh, make it possible for VFX studios to scale up not just their compute resources, uh, but also their most important asset, uh, which is the artists themselves. To learn more about media and gaming, uh, and particularly what we're doing in cloud, we will be at SIGGRAPH uh, in Vancouver in a couple of weeks, um, where if you're there, we'd love to see you. Perfect. Thanks so much, Leif. Cool. Thank you. All right. Hi, folks. We are here at the public sector zone at Next. I'm here with Bryce. Bryce, thank you so much for being here. Oh, thank you for having me. Uh, absolutely. So uh, first, why don't you start by telling us what are some of the problems that you're seeing in the public sector arena that you think we can help with? So in the public sector arena, accessibility seems to be a very big problem. I mean, today at Google Cloud, we're using things like chatbots to create 311 type of environments that allow people to access the government and other agencies directly from maybe your phone, assistant, a home device, whatever it might be, making it more accessible to the people today than it is before. So it's not so much as fill out a form as much as it's, let's ask a question. Also, with local agencies, we're starting to partner to create things like crisis response. So when hurricanes or things roll through, that we're enabling agencies to work together and collaborate on what they're doing today and actually respond to an incident very quickly. One of the things that I think these folks would have a lot of concerns with would be things around you know, privacy and security. You know, how are we making public sector and government customers you know, comfortable that we're protecting their data? Well, with privacy and security, we treat it the same way that we do here at Google today. Google is a secure environment, so we want you to have the same security that we have today in our environment. So with things like IAM and security policies and allowing people to create access and having very granular control over what people can and cannot do, it's great. And then our network is just complete, it's huge. It's privatized, and you have the ability to kind of stay off the internet and get that information back and forth securely. Awesome, thank you so much. If customers want to learn more about this, what, they sh what should they do? Um, go to Google Cloud um, slash solutions slash government and you can find out about all the different solutions. Awesome, thank you so much. Thanks team. We look forward to seeing more of your showcase recording later in the show. Coming up on the next live show channel, we have a session on Cloud AI. How to get started injecting AI into your applications. And head over to the featured Spotlight Sessions channel for Google Cloud's IoT vision. We'll be here with more Next Live during the break. Stay tuned.
Welcome back, I'm Stephanie Wong. I'm here with Mario Ciabarra, founder and CEO of Quantum Metric. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me, it's great to be here. So let's start at 10,000 feet. What prompted you to start your company? Have you ever been to a website and tried to purchase something, transact, and had a frustrating, you know, just a poor experience? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> what do you do when that happens? I leave the site. Right, you don't call them, you don't email them and tell them you'll wait until the site's fixed and, and come back. And if you think about it, how many other people have that bad experience on that same site, that same day? And when you step back a little bit and you think about the business, how do they find out about it? How do they find out how much it's impacting their organization? And so that's what we built Quantum Metric to do is solve that problem. And how specifically are you solving that problem for your customers? So if you think about a, a personal experience where you maybe you click add to cart and it doesn't work, you, like me, I'll, I mean, I'll click add to cart five more times. I'll rage click it. Yeah. And then I'll click reload in my browser and I hope that works. And then I click the back button and I go through all these different steps. And these are just a few behaviors that we track to say, I'm not having a good experience. Maybe I had intent to buy, but then I left. And um, we aggregate around those different experiences to figure out how much are each friction points costing their business. And we can actually quantify how much money that impacts and, and, and reduces their, their overall revenue based upon those friction points. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, the couple biggest challenges that you had with your initial infrastructure investment? For us, collecting data wasn't that hard. It was how do we analyze it? How do we get to the heart of where the value was? And so no matter what efforts we put into it, we sharded, we partitioned, we were really thoughtful about how we scaled at some points through hundreds of CPUs at databases to try to get to the, to the really valuable parts of them. And every day, the problem got bigger. We had more data. And so we would solve it today, but next week it would come back. And that was where we really had our biggest pain points was how do we take our data and make useful, actionable insights out of it. You also wrote an article earlier this year about um, some of the, your experiences with other cloud providers. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? When we had these problems, how do we solve for them? And you know, we stumbled upon Google BigQuery, and honestly, we can attribute our 200% our growth so far this year. We're on target to grow 400%. Really a large portion of that is honestly due to Google BigQuery and, and being partners with, with Google uh, Cloud have been, has been just a tremendous impact to our success. And when I look at the market and some of the messages that come across about who's winning the cloud war, a lot of people focus on the indicators of revenue. And I can tell you from our own personal experience, we've actually halved our cloud spend in the last month alone. It was just, it was frustrating to see that people focus on that as the indicator of who's winning the cloud war. So I wrote from personal experience about, I don't think the indicator is how much money is being spent in each individual cloud, but how they enable startups, enterprises alike, to succeed. And the tremendous support that we've had here at Google, I think that's the best indicator of who's really winning at Cloud Wars. And can you kind of elaborate more on how Google Cloud is being used by your internal data science teams to increase efficiency and help them? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. What we discovered when we switched over to Google BigQuery is that we had invisible handcuffs the entire time we did our product development. It was, honestly, I didn't know about it until after the fact. And I think a lot of people are going to have the same awakening. And it's really about the questions that we ask are really in the context of what answers can we get to. And so what we discovered was as soon as we removed those handcuffs, as soon as we could ask any questions that we wanted, a whole new world opened up in terms of data and data science. And so what we were able to do is actually write the data scientists into our application, into our platform, and we are able to ask hundreds of questions and then iterate on the responses of, to those questions and ask uh, deeper level questions. And it was really along the same process that our data scientists would follow. And building that path into our product, we finally got to the point where helping our clients, it's just simply logging in and the answers are there waiting for them. So with BigQuery, we actually have built data scientists into the product. It's been incredible. So you spoke about including data scientists into your product strategy. How does that impact get translated to your customers? Yeah, it's, it's really been incredible success at, at solving problems that our customers have never been able to solve before. So in the case of our data scientists and, and building that with BigQuery, we really have been able to get to answers that sometimes took weeks, maybe days, and now turned it into a few seconds. So that's been impactful. We, you know, I mentioned our growth, our success, but really our growth is based upon, we've empowered our clients to really recover hundreds of millions of dollars of revenue, and you know, we take it back to the problems that we solve, 
where people went to websites and had bad experiences, we're able to, to discover that, quantify it, and help get resolution faster. So issues that our, our customers wanted to get to answers in minutes that, again, before it took them days or weeks, and it helped them make decisions faster. So uh, really, it was, it was really speaking to the power of massive cloud scale. Being on Google Cloud is, is quite amazing, has been quite impactful for our business. Amazing, well thank you so much for sharing all of that. From Quantum Metric, we have Mario here. We appreciate your time. All right, let's check in now with our showcase team for more product demos. Hi, I'm Natalie and we're here with Ryan in the data and analytics section at Next. Ryan, tell us about what we're doing in real-time analytics. Yeah, so within real-time analytics, what we're really trying to do here is we've got a supply chain use case. And what we're trying to illustrate is the ability to take external and internal data sources, combine those together in real time, and get a better understanding of the environment that we have happening there. So in this case, what we have is we have some trucks that have started their routes, and those will then turn to ships and then ships back to trucks as they reach land on the other side. But what we're trying to do here is to assess, based on the route that they're taking, can we bring in weather data? Can we bring in then just also global news data and be able to actually get to a point where we can put a risk score on that route to say, hey, based on some port unrest that happens, maybe there's a strike that's happening, maybe some social unrest, mm -hmm. or even it could be something that's just as simple as like, hey, there's a hurricane that's dropping here. Yeah. Let's make sure that we can understand that, assess the real risk. Real time information. Real time, that's exactly it. And then reroute that in real time as well. So in this given example, right now, it looks like our potential risk, we're actually in a good spot right now. Let's give them some bad weather. Yeah, yeah let's give them some let's bad weather. Um, and let's, let's give them some really bad weather. So Ooh. we'll make it a high alert as well. So we'll add that in. And what that's going to do is essentially inject this piece of data mm -hmm. into the rest of the data feed that the, that the model is naturally taking in. And mm -hmm. it's going to inject this in and then have this bad weather present within that model. Got it. So we've added that in and we can see that oh, there's an alert for yeah. the person who's managing this to say, hey, we've got some bad weather. As a result, we've seen immediately that risk right there change from a potential risk all the way up, spike up to 89%. And so what that means is that it's likely time for us to take a look to see whether or not we can reroute this uh, shipment. Mm -hmm. But what's nice is with Google's platform, the serverless nature of it, and then also the integrated nature of it means that whether this is three trucks, four trucks, or 4,000 trucks, 40,000 trucks, Google can scale up to be able to deliver the solution that you need yeah. to be able to. Amazing, I think it's, it's pretty important to show just how dynamic businesses can be in terms of being able to make decisions on the spot with all different types of variables. So really great um, example. Absolutely, and I think that particularly when you're looking to make those decisions on the spot, doing it in real time and then bringing in, as you said, all of those other variables, mm. that external data, there's so much value in that that's outside of people's businesses where they typically think to look to find um, information and data and analytics to better inform them. Think about bringing in external data sources yes. as well. That's, there's a lot of value in that. Awesome. So, Ryan, what's next in supply chain? Well, in, in terms of supply chain and then I'd say in terms of real-time analytics at Google in yes. general, we're looking to just make our services faster, mm -hmm. easier, and more integrated. And every step that we take is about giving our customers more choice in terms of the languages that they use, the different products that they use, and then also just to ensure that they've got the ability to do what they want with their data, to get to those cool. results that are very specific to their businesses. Right, well that yeah. sounds pretty exciting. If uh, our viewers want to learn more about this space, where should they go? Um, cloud.google.com slash solutions is going to be the best place to go to. I encourage everyone to figure out um, how to get to that real-time analytics piece uh -huh. of that in particular, but there's a wealth of great solutions in there that you can read up on. Okay, well thanks so much for the demo. All right. Loved it. Uh, good stuff. <laughs> thanks. See you later. Hi, I'm Yuri. I'm here with Luke Mon, and we are at the AI Solutions booth here at Google Cloud Next 2018, and today we're going to talk about the recommendation engine. So Luke Mon, what is a recommendation engine? So a recommendation engine is one of our AI solutions. It's uh, what we call a reference architecture. Basically has code and a set of papers that describes to you how to implement this kind of solution on Google Cloud Platform. What can I build with it? Well, let me show you. So um, this shows you an example, an e-commerce store where the user might be scrolling through a whole catalog of items, picking ones that they're interested in, say they're adding them to a shopping cart. Um, as soon as they do that, then uh, the data that we've collected from them in that store can be sent to this recommendation engine and essentially recommend other items or products that they might be interested in buying. It works off of Google Analytics data, 
a uh, very popular product that Google has had. Uh, our Google Analytics 360 product allows that data to be directly synced to Google Cloud into BigQuery, basically what our data warehouse solution. Um, from, from BigQuery, the data is exported into cloud storage and then used as an uh, input to a train a model in TensorFlow that provides the recommendations. Uh, that model is loaded into App Engine, which serves as the API, essentially. And this is where the application server for the, the client application would make a request to the API saying, I've got a user, give me five recommendations for that user. Um, important to know that you've got to not recommend things that users have already bought or purchased, so you got to filter those ones out. Anyway, you provide that back to, to the user, and then um, on the store, you know, the user would see these items that we've recommended to them in addition to the ones that they've already bought or purchased. Excellent. So very, very popular application. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Now, let's take a look at another example of using AI, this time at the contact center. So, Steve, why don't you, uh, how can we apply AI to, to the contact center? So what we're trying to do is we're trying to help out when people call in to get much more easier assistance when they talk to a virtual agent versus having to go through a complicated phone tree. And we're also trying to help out the live agent when you eventually get connected to them, help make their job a little easier, provide them help as much as we can. And AI was a very easy way to do that. So what you're going to see is a person calling in and, and they're going to get responded to by the, by the virtual agent. At least the virtual agent is going to try to answer all their questions. So what happened is, is uh, one person's calling in. I just placed an order recently and one of the items are damaged. And so as the person's calling in, the contact center AI is able to discern what they're talking about, interpret it into real text, and get the context of the conversation. One, two, three, four, five. So it needs to go look up what the order number is to figure out what they actually want, re want returned. They also need to authenticate the customer, making sure it's the right person calling in. And so with this information, the virtual agent is actually going to be able to process the claim, process the refund, send an email to the customer, and actually process their, all their concerns on the spot. But what if a person wants a little bit more help, they want to be connected to a live person? I got the wrong order from Walmart. So the agent will hear this question. They need a little bit more information to figure out exactly what they want returned. Golf clubs. And so the virtual agent is going to hear this, but they, don't, they can't help all the way, so they need to connect it to a live agent. And so what's going to happen now is all that information, all that context from the previous conversation is going to get pushed to that live agent so they don't need to ask the customer again why they're calling. Thank you for calling Cloud Made Up Store. I see that you have ordered a set of golf clubs from Walmart. And so in the background, Contact Center AI is listening to this conversation. Is going to try to piece together what kind of help it can give the live agent. Yes, and it's broken. I need a replacement. So what you're going to see, you're going to see automatic pop-ups happen here, all these resources that the live agent can click through. They can read through some of these and figure out how exactly to help that live uh, person on the line without having to put them on hold, without having to go ask questions of somebody else. They can uh, help them right away. And by clicking through these articles, the live agent learned that they can't actually process a replacement, but they can process a return. And that's how we're using AI to help out contact centers. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. If customers want to learn more, where should they go? So they should go to our website. They can sign up for public alpha access right now and hopefully get access to one of our partners that we're working with. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's it for day two. Tomorrow on the next live show, we kick things off with the developer keynote, Made Here Together. Following the keynote, we invite you to bring your questions to a conversation about imagining the future of cloud with a group of Google's cloud engineering leaders. That's definitely on my list of must-use tomorrow. Later in the day, we have sessions on how to use Google SRE and reinventing databases for your journey to the cloud. Make sure to join us tomorrow starting at 8.50 a.m. Pacific for all of that, plus our developer keynote recap and more showcase demos. We'll see you then. Until then, goodbye from Next18 in San Francisco, California.